Sorry about that. Okay, welcome, uh, we'll get started today. So we have uh, uh, spent a lot of time discussing essentially the properties of uh, the Jellium model of in electrons with Coulomb interactions uh, in a uniform positive background. And uh, we discovered that it forms a metallic state at least at uh, high enough densities. Uh, and this metallic state uh, the Coulomb interaction gets screened. Uh, and then there are some collective excitations uh, of this uh, metallic state, including the plasmon and the particle hole continuum uh, that can express various response functions. And then we also computed uh, uh, the effect of spin response functions. And that can lead to, for sufficiently strong interaction, to some kind of magnetism. Uh, ferromagnetism or anti-ferromagnetism. Uh, and there's also the possibility of charge density waves, although many of these instabilities don't strictly occur in the Jellia model, but with more complicated dispersions uh, that we're gonna talk more about. And we saw all of this, both using Hartree-Fock theory and variational calculations, uh, and also uh, using diagrams. So. So up to now, the course has just basically dealt with one basic topic. <clears throat> and uh, with the next problem set, hopefully you'll get very comfortable uh, with everything we learned. So now we're going to talk about, so any questions or any comments on what we've talked about so far in general? Um, so now we're going to really change gears in a way and introduce many new concepts. <clears throat> Um, uh, and this has to do with the theory of superconductivity. So as I mentioned, uh, this was the basic idea, uh, came in a famous paper by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schieffer in 1957. Uh, and the quick summary of the idea uh, is that uh, electrons near the Fermi surface uh, do experience uh, an attractive interaction. Uh, and because of that inter attractive interaction, they like to form pairs. Uh, and then those pairs uh, essentially uh, condense into a zero momentum state, very much like a Bose-Einstein condensate. So we're just going to describe the variational calculation today uh, and then go on to also talk about excitations using what's called the uh, Boglibov theory. Uh, but let me make just some general remarks about <coughs> why electrons would want to, want, to, want to form a pair. Excuse me. Okay, so if you have uh, two particles uh, in, uh, oh, sorry, that was the, all right, so just consider, for example, two particles uh, in, in free space. So if you have a Hamiltonian like this, sorry. Of just two fermions, uh, minus del one squared over two m, minus del two two squared over two m, uh, plus some interaction between them, v of r one minus r two, uh, and and so and v of r is attractive, so it has you know some uh, here's a position of uh, here's some energy in position, uh, and this is r. Oh, I'm sorry, well. You're going along some direction, so it's not more R. It's R, and V of R, you know, has some attractive position, so something like this. Say there's some weak attraction, uh, something like this. And the question you can ask now: <clears throat> if there's a very weak interaction because attraction, which is what 
happens in a uh, in a Fermi liquid uh, because of the lattice vibrations, I, as I mentioned last time. There's some weak attractive attra uh, uh, attraction, uh, attractive interaction. The question you can ask is, does this mean that the two particles will form a bound state? So in other words, if there's some bound state energy here where the two particle wave function would look something like this. You know, this is psi of R1 minus R2. <clears throat> uh, and the basic result is that in D equals three, in three dimensions, um, an arbitrary weak interaction and, uh, uh, and uh, of weak attraction Uh, does not lead to a bound state. So you'll only get scattering states and there won't be any negative energy bound states. Uh, so you know, in, you know, one example of this is of course uh, the hydrogen atom where you've got a proton and an electron. Well, that's not an arbitrarily weak interaction. It's a Coulomb interaction which diverges and that we know does found uh, in fact an infinite number of bound states. But if you took uh, like a spherical well, as you might have studied in your quantum course, uh, you find that in three dimensions, it's not always the case uh, that there's a bound state. They can only be scattering states. Uh, so I think this was the reason uh, initially, one could imagine that people overlooked uh, this fact that there could be a weak attractive interaction between the electrons. Um, they would have just said, well, even if it's slightly weak, they're not going to form a bound state, then it'll still be a Fermi liquid again. So the key point was actually made by Cooper in a paper written the year before the BCS paper. He's the C in the BCS theory. Uh, and Cooper made the point, yeah, that's true in three dimensions, uh, but the situation for a Fermi liquid uh, is different. We don't actually have... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, just two electrons that are going to form a bound state. We also have a Fermi C. So if this is momentum space, uh, we have a Fermi C of occupied states. Uh, so this is the Fermi C in a metal. And what we, are, what we have learned from uh, the study of the electron phonon coupling is that if I put two electrons next to a Fermi C, one electron here and another electron somewhere else, uh, they have to occupy states in momentum space that are outside the Fermi C. Uh, and now it is these electrons, which are just outside of Fermi C, not in a vacuum, but outside of Fermi C, that, that are going to experience a weak attractive interaction. And so that's a very different question because the Fermi C, the rest of the other electrons can't be fully ignored. They're still there just as an exclusion principle. So this is the problem that Cooper looked at. Suppose you had a Fermi C, which was just rigid and sitting there, and then you added two more electrons uh, and they were not allowed to disturb the Fermi C, but they had to obey the exclusion principle. That is, if you wrote down the wave function for these two electrons, if you wrote down a wave function like this, uh, psi of R1, let's say it's a center of mass of uh, zero, and we're just focusing on these two electrons. This is R1 and this is R2. Well, you could take a Fourier transform of this and sum on K, and you say, well, it's some Fourier coefficients times e to the i k dot R1 minus R2. So this is the kind of wave function you might write down. Even for hydrogen, you could do this in principle and write it down. Uh, you have these two, you know, well, you shouldn't say hydrogen. Let's say a positronium where you've got, uh, uh, two particles of the same mass with an attractive interaction. But here you have two electrons and we just told there's a weak attractive interaction when we're looking for a bound state like this and writing it in Fourier space. Uh, but however, now you have the restriction and this is the key thing that the momenta occupied by these particles have to be bigger than Kf. Okay. Uh, and this is what, what, what Cooper noticed was by solving this problem of two particles in the presence of a Fermi C, that the situation was very different from two particles in free space. 
uh, that in fact, even an arbitrarily weak interaction always led to the form of a bound state. Uh, and you know, that's called the Cooper pair. Uh, and so two electrons around a Fermi C are actually susceptible to an arbitrarily weak interaction. So this was the key observation by Cooper. Uh, and uh, I can imagine in those days when there wasn't an archive, <laughs> nobody knew about it except Cooper's friends and it took a while for that to get published. Uh, but it was this uh, observation. He was at the Urbana Champaign, uh, a nuclear physicist, in fact, at that time. Uh, and then Bardeen and uh, Schieffer, Bardeen was a professor at Urbana Champaign, and Schieffer was his graduate students. Uh, they took this idea and came up with the DCS theory, <laughs> probably before anyone even heard of Cooper's work. I don't know the history. Uh, of course, today that wouldn't be the case. The archive would make sure everyone heard about it immediately. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so why does this happen? Uh, roughly speaking, uh, you know, when I'm looking at the physics of this electron uh, moving here near the Fermi surface, uh, its dominant motion, in fact, turns out to be perpendicular to the Fermi surface. The angular motion doesn't matter very much. And so you can uh, take some arbitrary, some direction like this, take a cross section uh, and draw the fermion dispersion in that direction. So this is this is momentum k and say the radial momentum. And this is your dispersion of the electrons. And these states are occupied. And, and then you just have one uh, electron here, another electron here, and looking at their, at their motion. Now you can, uh, uh, in fact, it turns out only the motion near the Fermi surface matters. So you can actually even linearize this. You can take a dispersion like this and this dispersion like this. Uh, and then you can even move this, this, uh, this guy over here just by translating uh, its momentum. And so then what you notice, the problem reduces, uh, problem uh, looks like, in fact, this is a fairly precise mapping, looks like a massless Dirac fermion. Uh, in one plus one dimensions. And this problem, you know, if you had asked a field theorist about this, they would say, yeah, yeah, this problem, uh, unstable, the fermions will form a pair to a weak attractive interaction, any weak attractive attraction. And in fact, the particle theorists would call this uh, chiral symmetry breaking, uh, where because of some attractive interaction of massless particles, you acquire some, uh, they acquire a mass gap and they and you break chiral symmetry. And that is the current theory of uh, chiral symmetry breaking. And that was put forward by Nambu. Uh, and he was directly inspired by the BCS theory. Of course, Cooper did this before, before Nambu. Uh, so it, it's a very similar problem in the end. Uh, it's not the big mistake you're making here as twofold. One is you're considering uh, uh, particles in three dimensions without the Fermi C. Uh, whereas here, what you really should consider uh, with a quadratic dispersion. Uh, and what you really should consider a Dirac particle in one dimension, and then ask, is that unstable to an arbitrary weak interaction? And the answer is yes. All right, now I won't go through Cooper's calculation because we have a better calculation, which uh, Cooper's calculation was uh, an approximation uh, because he assumed that these two electrons will form a bound state uh, and then the, the Fermi C will be rigid. But of course, that doesn't make any sense uh, because if these two electrons form a bound state, uh, maybe the next two electrons uh, around the Fermi C uh, will also want to form a bound state. The next two of them will come and so on and so on. And so in fact, the whole Fermi C will disappear or will it? So we have to do the whole thing self consistently. We have to account for the deformation of the Fermi C as everything is forming a bound state. And that's the BCS theory. So I'll just go directly to the BCS theory because it's better than the Cooper theory and not much more complicated. So here's the idea. 
So let's imagine that a pair of particles with coordinates R1 will first work in real space with the first quantized formulation and then go to second quantization. Uh, so here we have two particles with a wave function G of R1 minus R2. Now it turns out we do have to worry about spin uh, because these are fermions, so the whole wave function has to be anti-symmetric. And what happens in most superconductors is that the spin wave function is anti-symmetric, whereas the spatial wave function uh, is in an S-wave state, so it's symmetric on the exchange. So we also keep track of the spins. I write the spin wave function like this as chi 1, 2, where chi ij is this wave function. That's a spin singlet pair uh, saying that spin i is up and spin j is down, or vice versa with 1 over root 2. That's the first quantized, now one first quantized way of writing down a spin singlet pair of R1 of two electrons, labeled one and two, and and uh, some kind of bound state wave function, which we are going to assume is an even function of R1 minus R2, uh, because then the whole thing is anti-symmetric. Okay, so that's a bound state of two electrons. Uh, we don't know what G of R1 minus R2 is, and when and this will be a suitable thing to do. So now I want to make an, a bound state of uh, a wave function for n electrons. I'm going to assume n is even. Uh, so they're going to form n over two pairs. So I just do the very simplest thing. Uh, I take electrons one and two and put them in this, uh, this bound state, then electrons three and four in the same bound state and so on. And this is explicitly, as you can see, uh, uh, just exactly what you do uh, for a Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, except it's a Bose-Einstein condensate of pairs of particles. So this wave function uh, is independent of the average. You know, in, in general, you would say that the wave function is this times e to the i, uh, let's say, k center of mass dot r1 plus r2. So that would be a more general wave function where the center of mass is also moving with some momentum k. So here we're just assuming that this k center of mass is zero. So we have taken a pair of particles and put them in a zero momentum state. Okay, so now we just do that with all pairs and put them all in the zero momentum center of mass momentum state. And that's this part of the wave function here. That's this wave part of the wave function. Uh, so that's exactly what you do in a Bose-Einstein and condensate. You'll take every boson and put it in the zero momentum state. Okay, uh, now, for the bosons and condensate, that's the end of the story because they're just bosons. But here, the underlying particles are fermions. And so I do have to antisymmetrize. So I put this antisymmetrization operator here, uh, which says that I have to take the sum over n factorial terms where I just keep interchanging uh, any pair of particles and making sure the whole thing is antisymmetric. So, you know, it's the usual thing that we uh, said way back when. Uh, what the anti-symmetrization symbol is. Uh, it's just, you know, anti-symmetrization of any function of one, two, up to n uh, is sum over permutations minus one to the permutation times f of the permutation of particle one, permutation of particle two, up to pn. And there are n factorials of permutation and there's some normalization constant. The reason the normalization constant is just not just one over n factorial, which is in fact the, not the case for our case, is because some of the permutations may give you the same the same term. So that's what happens here. If you look at uh, this wave function, the normalization is a little bit non-trivial uh, because if I interchange one and two, the whole thing is anti-symmetric to begin with between one and two, so I don't get a distinct state. So you get the same state back. Similarly with three and four and so on. On the other hand, if I interchange one and three, then I get a different wave function and I have to keep it, I have to sum over all of them. So I end up in, you know, I, I can just forget about interchanging R1 with R2, but I do have to interchange R1 with R3, R4, and so on. Okay, so that's the wave function, that's it. And that's, that is in fact the entire BCF theory. This is the wave function. Uh, and now we're done and we just evaluate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian and find the best G. Uh, and, you know, that's all we're going to do with the rest of this lecture. Okay, but this, you know, so, so conceptually, we could have just stopped there, stopped here. This is the new idea.
I just write down a BEC of electron pairs. Uh, however, this is kind of hard to work with. As you've discovered, even the normalization, as I just told you, is a bit tricky to figure out. So we have to develop some tricks and the second quantization method really helps there uh, to do that calculation. Okay, so let's first of all write this in using second quantization. So that turns out to be very easy to write down. Um, it's right here. It's the same wave function in the second quantized form. So what are we doing here? We take a, a vacuum state with no particles. Then I take two particles at positions R1 and R2 with opposite spins. So I create a particle at position R1 with spin up and position particle at R2 uh, with spin that spin down, and then I integrate over all R1 and R2 uh, with an amplitude which depends on the wave function between them. So this gives you that every time you add. Oh, sorry, okay, I'm back. Uh, what happened? Oh, all right. <laughs> uh, my my iPad died. Okay. Uh, sorry. Is it connected? No, it's not connected. Excuse me. Oh. Oh, it's connected. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Uh, where was I? Okay. All right. It's probably my internet connection is getting a bit flaky. Okay. So what I was saying was, uh, you're all connected, right? And I think uh, everything is working. Yeah. Recording is working. Okay, it was just my iPad. Uh, yeah, this is all automatically anti-symmetric. It's just automatically a spin singlet pair uh, because G is an even function. So if I interchange R1 and R2, uh, I don't get any sign from here. But you see here that if I interchange an R1 and R2, uh, I will get, you know, if I just imagine what happens when I interchange R1 and R2, I will get, uh, you know, right now I have, D3 R1, D3 R2, side dagger up of R1, side dagger down of R2, G of R1 minus R2. So now let me just relabel R1 and R2 because there's an integral over them. So this thing is just one half um, plus side dagger up of R2 psi dagger down of R1, G of R2 minus R1. Okay, now I haven't done anything other than relabel R1 and R2. Uh, but now notice that this is equal to this. These two are equal. And then if I interchange these two, I take this here and tag that there, I pick up a minus sign. And then I get the same thing. Uh, then I get, in fact, precisely the uh, six spin singlet wave function where you get side dagger of R1 to spin up and side dagger of R2 to spin down minus side dagger of R1 to spin down and side dagger of R2 to spin up. So this, this whole combination is exactly the spin singlet wave function. So I don't even need to worry about uh, the, uh, the fact it's a spin singlet. It's automatically taken care of uh, provided G is an even function. Okay, so that's uh, the BCS wave function. Uh, so now let's go to Fourier space, just to a Fourier transform to momentum space. Uh, and then just a simple momentum uh, will give you this. Uh, this is almost looking like the way BCS wrote it down. So it's sum on K G of K 
G of K is just the Fourier transform of G of R1 minus R2. And then when you do the Fourier transform, you get C dagger K up and C dagger minus K down. So this is simply the statement that the electron pairs are in, have zero center of mass momentum. Uh, these opposite momenta come from the R1 minus R2 over here and the lack of any dependence in here of R1 plus R2. So the, the pairing, as often said, is between electrons which are on opposite sides of the Fermi surface, antipodal points on the Fermi surface, uh, which start pairing up with opposite spin, you know, the North Pole with the South Pole and so on. Uh, but that's nothing but the statement of, uh, of zero center of mass momentum. So as I say here, this is almost the form of the BCS wave function. Uh, uh, okay. However, uh, it's not the way BCS wrote it down. Uh, and that's caused endless confusion over the years. Uh, uh, they wrote it down in an even simpler way, which is equivalent uh, after you do what's called a projection. Okay. So what BCS, uh, this, this wasn't BCS's reasoning. Uh, they didn't write it down this way, but what they could have said if they had reasoned this way, they say, okay, well, this is, uh, you know, it still turns out if you try to do calculations with this, that it's kind of hard to work with this. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, a state with a fixed number of particles. The total number of particles here is always N, okay? So just like now I know that often, even when I did this here, the Fermi liquid, it was much, much easier to work in a grand canonical ensemble where I allowed number of particles to vary uh, and, and picked a chemical potential. And then I was sure that for a very large system, it made absolutely no difference. All corrections were down by factors of one over N uh, to work in this grand canonical ensemble. So similarly here, we're not doing thermodynamics, but we're doing quantum mechanics, but we are at zero temperature. And so let's just go to the grand canonical ensemble. So, so we can write down this wave function. So far, no approximation uh, in this form. I'll take this power n over two and put it up in the exponential, okay? And then I'll put this projection operator. This is just telling me that when you expand the exponential, you'll get various terms, each with different numbers of particles, this is just telling you, just pick out the, the single term that, or all the terms really, that have exactly n particles. So you project to the state with n particles. So right now, this psi is the same as that psi. Okay. All right. So now, however, so keeping that projection operator, now writing of the exponential actually brings a lot of advantages. Uh, because every term in the exponent, there's many terms in the exponential. And the one thing you've learned from the previous chapters that when you have operators, e to the a plus b is not the same as e to the a times e to the b. However, if the operators commute for different k, they commute because they refer to different particles. So these pairs commute with each other at different k. It's, it is true. So I can take this object and write it as a product. It's product of k exponential of this. Again, completely exact. Uh, this is, these are all different ways of writing down this original wave function so far. No approximations made from that wave function. And finally, you have exponential of just one of the terms here now. And now you notice that the square of this term uh, is zero because you get C dagger squared and C dagger squared is always zero because you get two fermions uh, in the same state. So, you can just take this exponential e to the x is just one plus x because x squared is zero. So this thing is just one plus x. So I just write it out that way. And then you pull out, it's conventional to write gk as vk over uk. And there's some overall normalization constant we're not keeping track of. Uh, so it becomes, uh, so it, this is how you write it, uk plus vk. C dagger k up, c dagger minus k down with the projection operator. So this wave function uh, is without approximation, just a rewriting of this wave function here. Okay, and that's almost what BCS did. Uh, BCS said that 
okay, let's forget about this projection operator. Uh, and it's in fact, that's a, correct. In the limit of large N, we can forget about it uh, because the dominant terms for any reasonable choice of UK and VK will be focused on some average number of particles and the window of fluctuation uh, of number of particles about that window will be square root of N. So as N goes to infinity, it has almost a delta function. This is exactly the same argument which you can make here, which I think you will make in the, one of the homeworks uh, from the BCS wave function. Uh, and the same argument that you made when you went from the canonical to the grand canonical ensemble. So finally, we have the BCS, the famous BCS state uh, right here. So this is the BCS proposal uh, for the wave function of a superconductor. Uh, looks, you know, kind of mysterious, <laughs> but as I keep emphasizing, it's nothing more than a BC, BC of electron pairs, just written in a uh, more convenient form. So this form is very easy to work with now. So this is what PCS did. They literally took this wave function and evaluated expectation values of the Hamiltonian. And it's just take some simple algebra uh, because of, you know these operators with different K all commute with each other. So it's easy to, to work out all the properties. And this is a state with a variable number of particles in some grand canonical ensemble. Uh, in fact, in the grand canonical ensemble, uh, you could even normalize it. Uh, you just take BCS, BCS, and look, you find that it's normalized to write UK squared plus VK squared is one for all K. Uh, another beautiful thing about the BCS wave function is that we can also reduce it to the wave function of a Fermi liquid. So suppose I took UK as zero and VK as one, so this, this is satisfied inside the Fermi surface and UK is one and VK is zero outside the Fermi surface. Then what will I get? Well, you can just see that this wave function then just becomes, uh, so for this case, uh, BCS becomes a product on K less than KF or EK less than zero, C dagger K up, C dagger minus K down of zero. And that's just to fill Fermi C of up and down particles. Um, okay, so that's, so basically we now have, at our, so these UKs and VKs are our variational parameters. For each momentum K, there is a parameter. Uh, well, there's some phases that will turn out not to matter, but the sum of the squares has to be one. Uh, in fact, so there's an angle, which is VK over UK. Uh, that's our variational parameter, and that's one angle for every momentum k. That's still a huge number of variational parameters. Uh, and if you choose those parameters for this values, we get uh, the non-superconducting state. And almost any other choice gives you superconductivity, in fact. So what we're going to see is that if you look at UK, if you make a picture of UK and VK, uh, so... So if I plot as a function of k, and this is the Fermi wave vector, then if I plot uk, so that's uh, zero inside the Fermi surface, I believe. Yeah, so in the Fermi liquid, it just jumps. So this is uk, uh, and vk has the opposite, jumps this way. Okay, this is VK. And what we're going to find that in a superconductor, it's almost the same, except this jump smooths out. So it basically ends up looking something like this. And in a superconductor, UK does, of course, it has to be the opposite because UK squared plus VK squared is one. Uh, and this window here, this energy scale is called delta, which is a small energy scale right near the Fermi surface. It's related to the pairing gap, as we're going to see, uh, and can be measured in experiments. Uh, so basically, the Fermi surface, where there was a discontinuity in the momentum occupation number, disappears. There's no Fermi surface. Everything is paired. Uh, but the pairing is really uh, effectively active only in a small window around the Fermi surface. When you go far from the Fermi surface, the pairing has a very weak uh, weak effect. Uh, 
All right. Okay. So now there's some, this, this wave function, however, has some remarkable properties. Uh, and, it, and it took a while for people to fully understand what they were. Uh, I don't think well, probably BCS understood them, but uh, uh, especially there was a paper by Anderson, which clarified many of the features of the BCS wave function. Uh, and these features are really crucial to understanding uh, all, you know, more, many of the remarkable properties, including the Meissner effect, where every superconductor expels a magnetic field, uh, its superconductivity itself, and also the Josephson effect, and so on. Uh, these all followed in a few years from uh, an interpretation and proper understanding of the wave function. So I'm going to just discuss that briefly before we turn to the more mechanical problem of actually finding finding these functions. In fact, these plots are actual functions that you can evaluate. They're not very complicated, and we'll find them soon enough. Uh, but imagine we have done that, and let's just try to interpret right now what is this phase function about? What, is, what are its remarkable properties? Okay. So, uh, Subhi, yes. I have a question about the. So here we're talking about just the wave function, right? But we haven't really talked about the Hamiltonian for the BCS theory. Is, is this like the Grassi of some Hamiltonian that we know already? Uh, yeah, so that's what I'll defer. We're going to do that in a while. But let's suppose, so now let's just postulate that there's some system uh, which forms to form a wave function of this type. The UK and VK are smooth functions, and not, not this kind of, you know, VK and UK are in the green and blue lines here. Uh, and and this is the this is the wave function. We want to study some of its properties more generally. You know, what is what is new about this wave function? Okay. okay, thanks. Yeah, so that's the limited question we'll ask. Uh, at least hope to finish that by today, and then we can address the question you ask. Uh, well, for what Hamiltonian is this a reasonable wave function? I've kind of already told you. Any Hamiltonian with a weak attractive interaction near the Fermi surface will form a BCS state. And that's kind of what Cooper showed by this kind of analysis of uh, effectively Dirac fermions in 1D uh, with a weak attractive interaction. Okay, but we'll, we'll see that soon enough. Okay, this is, this is obviously a typo here. Of type. So the key feature of the, of the uh, BCS wave function is what's called off diagonal long range order, sometimes uh, uh, shortened to that. Uh, the off diagonal is often dropped nowadays because it's kind of, uh, you know, become so familiar. This, but in the, in the early days, it was to distinguish this long range order from the kind of long range order we, that we uh, measured. Uh, for example, in a ferromagnet, a ferromagnet, there's long range order because the spin have the same orientation uh, in, in uh, <clears throat> at, dif at different points in space. Uh, similarly, here there's a, there's a spin or pseudo spin, as we'll see, uh, which also has a different orientation at different points, the same orientation, different points of space, uh, and it was called off diagonal because. It was first identified as a certain matrix element, off diagonal matrix element of the density matrix uh, of the system, the one particle density matrix. Okay, we will use a more modern operator way of thinking about it. Okay, so let's begin, however, first with uh, this particular BCS wave function and just let's take it, you know, literally true. Okay, suppose this is the actual wave function of my little piece of superconductor sitting here. Uh, and it can't be the entire story uh, because uh, uh, my piece of superconductor has a fixed number of particles, whereas this wave function seems to have an arbitrary variable number of particles. But, but okay, maybe our superconductor is connected to some reservoir and, uh, and so the particles are coming in and out. Okay, let's, uh, but in the end, we don't even need to do that. But let's take this wave function at face value uh, and evaluate the following uh, expectation value. So I take the BCS state and I just evaluate the expectation value of CK up, C minus K down. Okay. Uh, so that's an operator. 
with momentum particles, particles with opposite momentum and opposite spin. And just look at it expectations out there. Now in any system with a fixed number of particles, uh, this is going to be zero because no matter how many state particles are here, no matter how complicated the state, if it has a fixed number, this removes two particles. So removing two particles, well, we end up with a state with n minus two particles. Uh, and uh, this will uh, have n particles, so the whole thing has to be zero. But in the BCS state, as written down, uh, this is not zero. So what we have, we have what's called a condensate. It's a condensate uh, of electron pairs, uh, which seems to acquire a non-zero expectation value. In fact, does acquire a non-zero expectation value in the BCS state. Okay, now this, this is actually very, very significant, and in fact, the correct way to think about it, but uh, you might be you know, saying, well, okay, this is just an artifact of the, of the bizarre choice you made of to ignore the total number of particles. So I want to make that a little more precise. Okay, so first of all, let me just take not just the BCS state, but a whole family of BCS states. I'm gonna call them BCS sub theta. Okay, the family of BCS data, just like the old BCS states. So you worked very hard. You found some UK and VK uh, as your optimal variational parameters. Uh, and then I say, all you got to do uh, is every time you have a VK, you put in this phase factor of e to the i theta. So every time you add two particles, they come with a phase factor, theta, e to the i theta. Okay, so this is a whole another family of wave functions. Uh, it's a one parameter family of wave functions. And the important point is that these one parameter value of family of wave functions uh, is basically the same wave function uh, because after I do a projection, suppose I do take my physical uh, particle with a projection, uh, where I project to n particles, then, uh, then it'll be the old wave, wave function with an extra factor of e to the i n theta over two because Every time I added two particles, I got a factor of e to the i theta, and that does nothing else I did. So there's an overall phase factor in front of the wave function, which I can't measure anyway. Uh, so it makes no difference to any, any physical quantity. So, so I have a one parameter family of wave functions then, which after projection are the same. And even before projection, I know that in the large n limit, the energy is all the same. So all of these wave functions, in fact, if I do my hartree fock theory on this wave function, Oh, it's not hard to fuck my variational calculation, uh, then I'm guaranteed that the energy will be independent of theta. So I have really a one parameter family labeled by an angle theta, uh, which gives me uh, the BCS ground state. So in fact, the BCS state uh, that I wrote that BCS wrote down, they made a choice. They actually found an infinite number of states. Uh, which are labeled by this angle theta, and the BCS theta is just happens to put theta equals zero, but there's no reason to do that. You could take any angle theta. All right, so that's uh, one key observation. And now what you have to realize is that this is a very close analogy of what happens in a ferromagnet. So when you take a ferromagnet, let's take a XY ferromagnet, ferromagnet only lie in a plane, then you, know, you could say that all the spins line up in a ferromagnet along the X direction, that'd be a good description of the ferromagnet, but there's actually one parameter family of states labeled by the angle theta, uh, and you could have taken any theta you wanted. So you picked one uh, and, and you said, well, that uh, that's what ferromagnetism is, is the system picks on its own a given angle theta. And that is in fact of what the theory of superconductivity is. Also, instead of taking a spin operator, you take this pair operator, and, and what the system is doing is that it's picking an, a, a, a constant phase for that pair operator. So there's a, post, there's a condensate and the condensate has a fixed phase. And that phase involves spontaneous symmetry breaking. It just picks an arbitrary angle, just like in a ferromagnet, you pick an arbitrary orientation of the, of the spins. Okay. So, and now what, what so there's, and what is the symmetry here? Well, in, in spins, you know, there's a spin rotation symmetry in the Hamiltonian. Um, so what is the symmetry that's being broken by choosing this phase? Well, the symmetry is broken 
is really part of the electromagnetic gauge symmetry. So here we are ignoring the gauge field. Uh, but if so, in the absence of the gauge field, the, the system has a global U1 symmetry where it can rotate each electron operator by a phase factor e to the f phi. So if I make this transformation, the Hamiltonian won't change at all, uh, provided phi is independent of k and sigma. Uh, and when I make this transformation, you can see from here uh, that the angle theta will also transform under this rotation. So there's a rotation symmetry, which is left over from the electromagnetic gauge symmetry. Uh, and that rotation symmetry is broken by the presence of this condensate. Okay, so that's a lot of fancy words, but this was the first example, you know, of broken gauge invariance, the Higgs phenomenon and everything else. Uh, but I'm now trying to put it in a modern language. Okay, so that's really what the BCS state has. It has this overall phase degeneracy, which is a physical phase here, uh, at least in this many particle uh, space. Uh, and uh, there's a whole one parameter family of wave functions. However, you still might not be convinced. So let me, yeah, I want to finish this very important discussion. You might say, okay, that's all great and good, but the actual wave function uh, is not uh, a constant phase wave function. Uh, the actual wave function is the projection of the BCS wave function at fixed particle number. And in this case, there's no condensate, this is zero. So what are you talking about? How can I, I my little sample here, uh, if I try to measure this operator by injecting two particles, I'm not going to see an expectation value uh, because the sample has a fixed number of particles, uh, basically. <laughs> All right, so what, uh, what's going on here? Well, again, there's an analogy with the, with the XY ferromagnet. So for a ferromagnet, you could also do the same thing. You could say, you know, you told me that the wave function is a ferromagnet spin pointing here, but I can say, well, I don't like that. I don't want to break any symmetry. Uh, the system is really in what you'd call today a cat state. It's the sum of all of these states pointing in all different directions. And that state perfectly preserves the symmetry. Uh, and uh, therefore, um, you know, and, and there's no broken symmetry. You can just say that that's that's the way I prefer to think about it because the ground state wave function uh, is a superposition of of these states that uh, point in different directions. Now, that's not a very useful way to think about things because each of these states that you're superposing are macroscopically distinct. So any small perturbation will collapse the cat into dead or alive or one given orientation in the real world. Uh, and and so that's why in a ferromagnet, you say, well, it just points in this direction. In fact, the same is true here. Uh, any simple perturbation will, well, okay. It's not quite the same thing because if I really have an isolated superconductor with fixed particle number, it cannot have a definite phase because precisely because of this statement. So what happens? So how do I really characterize a superconductor? Uh, so first thing, uh, yeah, so so to do that, you have to, uh, let's just see that the analogy with this XY furrow magnet is actually perfect uh, because I could think of the projection operator as just the average over, uh, over different theta. So if I, you know, if I take this BCS theta, if I take this wave function. So what I've noticed in this wave function, every time I have uh, add two particles, I get a factor of e to the i theta. So if I want to pick out the part of this wave function, which has exactly a prefactor of e to the i n theta over two, what I should do is just multiply it by e to the i minus i n theta over two and integrate from theta to two pi. And then all the terms that don't have exactly n particles give me zero. So this, this average over angles with this phase factor is exactly the average over different orientation analog of the ferromagnet. Okay, that's point number one. So this tells you, this shows us how to work with this function, this actually do this projection. It's not that difficult. You just have to average over thetas. Okay. So now let's go back to ferromagnet. And how do you actually, what's a good, way, better way to derive, to really describe the ferromagnet that it has long range order? You know, you said, well, just measure the spin expectation value and it points in one direction. That's not really the 
you know, the most cleanest statement. The cleanest statement is if I measure two spin expectation values, you know, here and here, they will point in the same direction. So that's the long range order. I have to not take one spin operator, I have to take two of them and verify that they point in the same direction by measuring the two point correlation function. That's what you have to do. So let's do the same thing here. So what I'm going to do is now write down this Cooper pair operator that creates a Cooper pair, not averaged over all positions, center of mass position, i.e. in center zero center of mass state, uh, but at centered at some position R, okay? So this is the center of mass position R, and then they differ by little r, and then the wave function G of R. So this clearly creates a Cooper pair centered at position R, not in the zero moment of state, okay? So, and so now we're gonna define the condensate, which is the expectation value of this operator in the BCS state. Uh, we can pick any value of theta. In fact, theta will end up being the phase of sine art. So the sine art is the condensate and it's zero, uh, and it's equal, to, you know, it's equal to the expectation value of this Cooper pair operator uh, in the BCS theta state. Okay, again, I've given a few different information that you can evaluate a lot of this just from the anti commutation relation of all the operators. On the other hand, just as before, we know that this expectation value of zero uh, when you project it, because this involves pair of electrons here now in real space. So what I really should measure, yes, question. Uh, muking, mute muting. Yeah, hey, so we are, I have a question regarding equation 19. It should one of the spins be spin down. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. All right. So now I have this Cooper pair operator, which is think of the analog of a local spin operator, but in this um, larger Fox space rather than spin space. It's sometimes called the Numbu pseudo spin space. Uh, <clears throat> so I have this, it's like a spin operator in this Numbu pseudo spin space because it has two annihilation operators or two creation operators. Uh, and so therefore, because it creates two particles, if I project, if I use the projected wave function, I'll get zero. Okay. All right, so these two wave functions with, project, with projection and without projection seem to have rather different expectation values uh, because I've said that this is more like the cat state and this is just a VCS state pointing in one different direction. But this state is a bit more physical for us because it has a fixed number of particles. So. We are reluctant to give up on this state. <laughs> All right, but we will. However, let's consider the two point correlation function. So this is the key thing. So now here, I annihilate a Cooper pair at the origin and then I create it very far away. So I'm looking now at the, effectively the operator which annihilates a pair here and creates it there. And we are testing to see whether they have the same phase or not. Uh, and in the BCS wave function with angle theta, they all have the same angle theta. And so as R goes to infinity, if you, you can evaluate this, this is a very painful but straightforward calculation with all the wave function I've just given you. You can just evaluate this thing. Uh, as R goes to infinity, you'll find it goes exactly to the square of that. So that's really the fundamental property of the BCS wave function. Uh, that it has long range order. That if I look at the Cooper pair operator here and there, th that correlation function doesn't decay to zero. It decays to a non zero value. That's why we call it a condensate because there's long range correlations and it doesn't decay to zero. And the important point is that even if you do the projection now, it doesn't matter. The answer is the same. Uh, that uh, it goes to the same value because this operator here conserves number of particles. This combination conserves number of particles. So whether you did the projection or not doesn't make much of a difference uh, because you know n and n plus one and n plus two will give basically the same answer uh, because of uh, as you can check by you know actually doing the projection by this uh, by this angular average. Okay, that's a very tedious calculation, but uh, 
And I think maybe in the homework you'll do some pieces of it. Uh, all right, so this is the this is in fact the most important statement here, the definition of off-diagonal long-range order, uh, and it's true no matter what. That is, you could take a projected wave function, you could take a non-projected wave function, you could take a cat wave function, you can make it point in any direction you want. It doesn't matter. You're going to get this thing not decaying to zero. And this is simply the statement like in spin in the ferromagnet that the spins point in the same direction over here and there. You can't tell which direction. They could even be in a superposition of directions. It doesn't matter, but they're the same in any given port part of the wave function. Okay. So then, so that's all, these are all correct statements, I hope. Uh, so now you see that there's actually, uh, there's a, this BCS theta wave function, which looked rather strange to us when we wrote it down, uh, has a very nice property. Uh, that this other wave function, which looked more physical to us, which had fixed number of particles, doesn't. And that property is sometimes called the clustering property, which is something you'd like, you know, when you're doing any kind of local field theory of anything to have. Suppose I have two operators, A and B, could be any operators. Uh, and then you move them really far apart from each other. One is here and the other is on the moon. Surely in any kind of many body state, what's happening here shouldn't depend on what's happening on the moon. And so this thing should factorize or cluster, okay? Uh, reasonable wave functions should do this. Uh, any kind of local field theory, when you work with the field theory, this is what you always find, that you get this clustering property. This is one of the defining properties of quantum field theory and should be the property even of, you know, electrons with uh, with not too long range interactions. Uh, however, what we see now is that this projected wave function, this wave function, Pn, does not have a clustering property because the one point expectation value is zero but the two point correlation function is not zero. So it does not factorize. So this is, this is not true for the projected wave function, but it is true for the BCS wave function. So in that sense, actually the BCS wave function is better because it satisfies clustering and really you shouldn't lose any sleep about the projection. In fact, it's probably better if it's not there because then you get a better behaved wave function. Just like in a ferromagnet, you don't lose any sleep about uh, you know, the fact that the spin, uh, all directions are equivalent and you can't, how do you pick a direction? Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't experimental situations you have to worry about this, uh, you know, and we can come to that later, I won't in this course, and you can often do that correction by actually doing the projection by this trick. But in most situations, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and you just work in this uh, canonical grand canonical frame where the BCS wave function has a definite theta rather than having a definite n. In fact, there's a, the two of them from this relation you can show have some kind of Heisenberg uncertainty relation. They conjugate variables like position and momentum. Here is the number of particles in the angle theta. Uh, okay. All right, that's one o'clock. So that's basically a uh, kind of a conceptual discussion of what spontaneous symmetry breaking is uh, associated with, uh, you know, the global U1 symmetry related to gauge invariance of the theory. Even once you put in the electromagnetic gauge field, uh, and all of these concepts uh, of broken gauge invariance by a by a condensate uh, apply essentially with no changes. Uh, to uh, to the Higgs phenomenon in particle physics. Uh, that's how the electron gets its mass by uh, chiral symmetry breaking coming from condensate associated with the Higgs field. It's for the SU2 cross U1 uh, gauge field. So of course, there are many more indices and lots of bells and whistles, but the basic idea is the same. Uh, and you know, when you learn about this in particle physics, uh, there you have relativistic field theory, so it's the particle, you know, you don't worry so much about number conservation, but you know, you just you just assume this without batting an eyelid. Uh, it's a little harder to accept here, but really, it's it's fine. There's no there's no uh, there's no problem with uh, op 
bosonic operator like a Cooper pair operator acquiring an expectation value. Just like there's no problem for a ferromagnet point in one direction. Okay, any further questions? All right. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. So in ferromagnet, uh, if the spin in different uh, position can have some spin waves and in yeah. uh, superconducting phase, if we have a, a spatial varying phase, can we get some wave? Yes, so there can be, although it's here it's a bit more complicated because uh, of the long range Coulomb interaction. So what happens is that the phase, if you look at phase fluctuations of theta, thetas, you form a wave of theta instead of making it uniform. Normally you would expect what's called a Goldstone mode in field theory, there should be some Goldstone boson. Uh, but here, because of the long range Coulomb interaction, and this is again somewhat analogous to the Higgs, you know, the, the Higgs phenomenon also, the phase fluctuations of theta actually become uh, massive as the field theory would say, and here that's the plasma. So in fact, the plasma is still present even in a superconductor, uh, and it's associated with, and it's pretty much fluctuations of theta. That's how the plasma appears in a superconductor. So, um, right. So, so that's the analog of the Higgs boson having a mass is the plasma. At least, okay, there's, it's a little more complicated here than in the Higgs theory. There's only one Higgs boson. There's only essentially longitudinal, uh, uh, sorry, there's only, because it's relativistic, things are simpler in the Higgs theory. Here, there's two types of fluctuations. There's the transverse and longitudinal gauge fluctuation and the longitudinal ones give you the plasmons and the transverse one give you the Meissner effect, uh, which we'll say a little bit about, I think, pretty soon, yeah. But yeah, the short answer is fluctuations of theta give you plasmons. <laughs> Thank you. Because of the long range interaction. Uh, can I ask a question regarding your last answer? So, yeah. so when you're saying uh, long-range Coulomb interaction, why aren't we taking into account screened interactions between electrons instead? Oh, uh, that is the screening. I mean, you know, as I roughly said, if you, so yeah, uh, of course. Previously, we talked about screening by screening of the Fermi surface, but the, but now the Fermi surface is gone. So what are the long distance density fluctuations that cause screening? Well, as I just mentioned, theta and uh, number of particles or density are conjugate to each other. So theta fluctuations are basically conjugate to density fluctuations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this plasmon mode, which is one representation of screening physics uh, at, at finite frequencies, but if you if you, for example, did a screening experiment where you actually put in uh, an electric charge in a superconductor and want to see how it was screened, it would be screened by theta acquiring some uh, expectation value, which is spatially dependent. I see. Uh, so, 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 it, theta fluctuations really hide, every, you know, take over all the task, uh, both screening and uh, and plasma, and that was that took place in a Fermi liquid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see, thank you. And another question is regarding the analogy with the ferromagnet. So in the ferromagnet, the physical ground state really does have like a selected phase because uh, like a Schrodinger cat state would be yeah. broken by fluctuations, right? But here, um, so in the argument that we have here, so uh, the actual physical ground state, yeah. it, it doesn't give you any uh, anomalous average, right? That's correct. So if you had an isolated superconductor, just a sample sitting on its own, uh, just in vacuum, not connected to everything, anything, then you're right. It will not uh, have any expectation value. On the other hand, uh, let's in the ferromagnet, let's think about it differently. Suppose I took a ferromagnet, uh, which is pointing in the X direction. Mm -hmm. And then you came along and put a very, very tiny field uh, pointing in the Y direction. And what the system will do is just rotate all the spin in the y direction. So a very tiny field would cause the ferromagnet to rotate in the direction of the applied field. Mm -hmm. That's what spontaneous symmetry breaking is. It's, there's always some tiny field that causes 
your cat state to collapse in some direction. There's always some asymmetry in the real system. Okay. Yes. So now, instead of taking a very perfect superconductor, totally isolated, suppose I take a superconductor and I connect it to very tiny wire that goes out to infinity, which is also superconducted. Uh, and that wire has some phase because it's just really connected to some reservoir, or I can control the phase of the wire by a magnetic field. Then what will happen is that my big sample will rotate its phase to line up with the phase in the wire. Okay, so so you can do the same thing. That's what a squid, a squid. That's what, how a squid works. Really, you have a superconductor; it lines up its phase due to all the wires and magnetic field that are connected to it. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it took a while for people to appreciate. You know, while they were understanding all these things of Josephson effects, squids, and so on. Uh, that this phase theta is a very physical thing, just like the phase of a ferromagnet, and can be manipulated in experiments. Uh, you can measure its time dependence. That's the Josephson effect. You can measure interference effects associated with it, uh, and so on. Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's not as unphysical as it first seems. It's not some trick we invented to do a projection. You can do experiments to manipulate the phase. I see. And another question. So basically the average, this anomalous average we've been looking at, it's like an order parameter, right? But we yeah. could only have it non-zero when we were doing this approximation of a grand canonical ensemble. It, it, does there exist a way uh, while staying in a canonical ensemble of having an order parameter, of defining an order parameter? No. No, so this is, I mean, just from conservation of particle number, there's no way some operator like this can have a zero, or sorry. As long as it's, you know, as long as you're taking an expectation value in a state which has the same number of particles on both sides, this has to be zero. Okay, but, but you know, but this statement is- you do have this equation number, uh, let, me, let me see, uh, equation number 20, no, 21, 21, um, well, the question where you have, yes, 22. So yeah. in the question 22, this is like a like statement that is like is true both for canonical and grand canonical picture, right? Correct. So you have to look at the two point correlation function, not the one point. Yeah. So you will see spontaneous. I mean, you know, you can just interpret. And in fact, this is what people will do more formally. You say you have spontaneous symmetry breaking if this correlation function goes to non-zero value as r goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. and that is long range order because something on the moon knows about the phase over here. So it's infinitely long range. And that's true in the canonical or the uh, uh, grand canonical. It's just that if you insist on the clustering property, then you have to work in a grand canonical ensemble. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So sometimes you just have to know if you're a canonical that you cannot cluster. And that's kind of hard to <laughs> keep track of, right? And also the statement that you know, suppose you're in a ferromagnet, I can say, all right, uh, uh, suppose I start in a state which has, um, what is it, uh, you know, some total SX equals zero. I mean, uh, and spin is conserved. Uh, uh, that's an SC, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, uh, if I start in a, some state that's rotationally invariant and then I cool a ferromagnet below its critical temperature and, and it's completely isolated from any magnetic fields, by angular momentum spin conservation, it cannot acquire a moment. So, uh, so that state also uh, will, in a perfect world, if it's a perfect crystal, will form a cat state with a superposition of all different moments because it can't decide which way to choose. Uh, it's just, yeah, yeah I think. The difference between the two cases is that this kind of thought experiment, uh, where you just decouple the system for, from everything else, is much easier to imagine for a superconductor than it is to imagine for a ferromagnet. <laughs> for a superconductor, it's very, you know, you can just take a sample and not put any wires to it, and that should, have, should be in a fixed number of particles. That's true. Uh, but the moment you start putting wires, then it's very sensitive to the phase of the wires in the, in the low temperature phase. Context. Yeah, thank you a lot. Yeah, sure. <laughs>
yeah, so have a careful read of this. I, I think these are, uh, yeah, <laughs> these are difficult concepts, but there, there are a number of calculations here, which all can be done. I mean, they're just simple calculations starting from the wave functions and evaluating all these expectation values. It's yeah, something you can do on a, without too much trouble, just by using anti-commutation relations. Just a bit of a mess when you have, especially a four operators. Not too bad. Okay, uh, so I guess the problem set is due today, and uh, we'll uh, put a new problem set up soon. And, uh, and there will be a discussion session tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Okay, see you on Monday or tomorrow.